go. So, recording from now. Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Chris Morrison. Good morning. And my name's Jane Secker. And we're the co-chairs of the Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group, Special Interest Group of the Association for Learning Technology. We're very excited today, aren't we, as we well? We are, yes. Yeah, this we are. is webinar number... 60s, 60s number 60. So, so no expense has been spared here in the celebrations, absolutely. have they? We're okay. rolling out the red carpet. Okay, and what have we got? Diamond anniversary. So here we have it. <laughs> so there, there we go. This is this is this is the extent of that we go to in order to, to the creativity the creativity the, the sort of the pageantry yes. i would say yes of, of, of just wait webinar. till we get to the coronation absolutely. imagine what we're going to be doing then indeed if this Who is knows? just a small taste it's of how creative we can be yeah. Yeah. so yes very excited i did want balloons and party poppers and 60 banners but you wouldn't let me um you were worried people might think it was your birthday uh, weren't you yeah, I, was, I know yes uh <gasps> Possibly. Uh, so what have we got going on today? We've got uh, a bunch of copyright news, some very exciting things, events and all those sorts of things. But the main topic of today is uh, another becoming a copyright specialist. And we've got two fantastic guests yep. with us today, Lisa Moore and Tim Riley. So we'll introduce them. Absolutely. In a but shall we get on with the main order of business? Well, it's not since really we, the main order, is it? But it's just the thing that we do since we, since last, we met. last met. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what's this picture all about? We were on our way to Senate House, mm -hmm. my favourite conference venue in central London. Um, and we were we were discussing what we ought to wear at Ice Pops, I think, weren't yes. we? We were, we were also both thinking about a new look we're, for us. Yeah. So um, in our kind of role as... And I think we can see webinar it. host stroke children's entertainers. Yeah. So this has got an interesting is that is that animal print on or oh, those are dungarees, aren't they? They're definitely dungarees. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're both thinking dungarees are gonna be the new look this summer. They're gonna be big, aren't they? But yeah, that that is that's Chris's outfit, I think, the mm. one with the green shirt, isn't it? Well, you're asking the wrong person because I'm colorblind. Like <laughs> I know that they are lots of colours, but I couldn't necessarily pick out which ones they were. Yeah, so Coming soon. Okay, coming soon. You, you, yes, watch this space yeah. for more fashion tips uh, from us. Uh, so this is a reminder that we have uh, a, an archive of webinars and blogs. And we're hoping that we've got Greg popping And we stuff have in the Greg absolutely Yay. putting things in here um, and links from there. So let's let's get on to the uh, the next part, which is the ever perennial copyright new. <laughs> So the first item of copyright news, Greg, we've already got the, the link in there, he's put in there. It's very exciting because we have done a meetup with the Pedagodzilla podcast team. So Copyright Waffle meets Pedagodzilla and our topic was communities of practice and the Muppets. So how do you create the most sensational, inspirational, celebrational, Muppetational community of practice? I was going to hope you were going to say that. Yes. I couldn't have said that. Yes, it, it's it's actually the second time we met Mark and Mike, mm -hmm. who run Pedagodzilla, um, and this came out this morning, this yes. episode, so hot off the press, it and um, we had such a fun time talking to them at Playful Learning that they wanted to talk to us more, yeah. and we're also meeting up with them next week at the Lilac Conference to record a podcast as well with the Chatting Info Lit New Professionals um podcast that was launched a couple of weeks ago as well absolutely so, so it's, those, all, it's all about the podcast it is at the moment. so for those of you that haven't heard any of the pedagogical podcast they're absolutely brilliant yeah the way that they they work is they pick a topic about learning theory um, and then pick something from pop culture to help explain it by way of analogy and metaphor so we're talking about communities of practice and we're talking a lot about this group these webinars and all the fabulous people that come along and how we um talked about copyright 
uh, it sounds like a mad time. idea but it kind but of it works can, and, and actually looking it, at it well, through it the lens it doesn't kind of work it does work it does yeah, yeah. it really good through, it does. through the Muppets and there is a musical treat in there as well there is um, yeah which yeah. we may uh, we may share later on uh, if we can find it uh, okay so the next thing is serious next news announcement. yeah serious news so there was uh, some really exciting news last week I think this came out uh, no actually it's supposed to be May first of April sorry um and it's not an April Fool's joke. No. Um, so some of you will have been following what's happening um, with Creative Commons licensed images. We held a webinar about this, I think about 18 months ago now, um, where people will try to put up Creative Commons licensed images with an old version of the license um, to try and kind of catch you out if you then don't um, attribute them correctly. So Corey Doctorow, um, has been very outspoken about this copy, copyright trolling um, and picked this up off his um, blog that essentially Flickr have now made an announcement um, saying, you know, uh, that, that this practice is, is, is basically completely against the spirit of their licenses. Um, and a really good quote um, that we just picked out from his, his post about that really where he's saying you know obviously if you if you are putting a creative commons license on your work it is an explicit message that i want you to use it and and you know not, not i am a pedantic asshole with a fetish for well formed attribution strings uh, so that's, that's typical well. typical sort of thing, Corey. Right? he'd yeah. say it very fast as yeah. well he probably yes he would and yeah. i wouldn't have quite understood what he'd said so and then you'd this. catch up eventually yeah so we did uh, have a, uh, a conversation with Corey on one of the previous Copyright Waffle podcasts. So check out his in-depth discussion of that. And this is an update on that. Story. Yeah. And on the blog post, there is a link through to, um, you know, basically the, the Flickr announcement, what they're, what they're saying, how they've sort of changed their, their practice and, you know, being very clear that this, this is not um, acceptable to, to do this and to go after people and demand payment if they misattribute your, your image. Yeah. So I think it sounds like good news and um, maybe a topic for us to talk about in a bit more detail at a future webinar. Absolutely. I can see Chris Slater saying just had another one of those pop up um, at Kent recently. So that it is something that where universities are yeah. um, targeted for these. Things. Absolutely. Um, this is to say that the recording of the fair dealing event that we ran in conjunction with the Institute for Advanced Legal Studies, where we had Amanda Wackerook from the University of Alberta and uh, Kyle K. Courtney uh, from Harvard. Join us um, back in February and Amanda was talking all about fair dealing cases in Canada and looking at how Canada's kind of the, the sort of halfway between UK and US in terms of its legal tradition and some of the interesting things that have happened there around fair dealing. So that, yeah. that recording is available for anyone that wasn't able to um, great it, event so. as well really excellent yes. excellent event yes um and another recording of an event another excellent event that was um took place in february um a copyright um uh, you know flexible copyright exceptions um emily hudson was one of the speakers i think mm -hmm. at this event that some of you might have joined um live but um i've just popped a link we put a link into the uh, where this is hosted on YouTube. So if you missed it and you want to catch up, um, then, um, and it's hosted by Felix Reda um, mm -hmm. as well. And I think Ben White is speaking. There's a couple of other people as well. But yeah, it's good. Did you mention Emily Hudson? Emily Hudson speaking. Yes, I did. Is Emily with us on the call? I don't know. Do you want to give us a summary of what she said? Uh, yes. Maybe if there's time later on. Uh, so moving on to the next one, the bookings for Icebox Woo! have opened. This is where the party pop up. So this is going to be, um, I think I've said before, the, the best ever looking like. It's going to be the best ever. Not to say that the previous ones weren't good, no. but just that this one, it's all coming together and it's partly. It's a festival of it's copyright a festival. literacy. And, and because, yeah. because, we're Bring working, your tent. because we're working with the University of Glasgow, um, Greg's doing fantastic work helping setting arrange up the beer tent. There. Oh no, he's not setting up a beer tent. No, no sorry. So. No. Um, and and the partnership with Create, yes. the uh, research centre there, it, it's it's looking like it's going to be fantastic. It so is. the bookings are open. They're already coming in. We're pleased to see that. Um, and we we, we are going to be putting up a program. The program is soon. is coming together. So uh, all to look forward to. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, yeah. Webinar evaluation, yes. Webinar evaluation. We want to evaluate what you think of this. 
we did this once before. We did. We did. Um, but we have been running these webinars for some time. This, as you know, this is number 60. Um, and so we are planning, um, or we have got a survey that we're we're about to start publicising. It is up and live now. So we're going to get an email out on this copy seek about this um, and in the, the Cool SIG newsletter as well. Um, but we would just like to give you kind of advance warning of this. We are looking to build on the data that we collected from the survey we did right at the, um, I think we did it right at the end of 2020, mm -hmm. where we were trying to sort of work out what impacts we'd had and what we should do going forward. It was really, really useful, um, but we feel it would actually be helpful at this point to also just understand what, what the benefit is of the webinars, whether you just want us to stop and go away mm -hmm. or, you know, whether there is something different we should be doing. So please do um, look out for that survey and, um, you know, tell us honestly what you think about what we're doing and what how you'd like these webinars to, to be in the future. And we'd also say huge thanks to Sarah Hammond at Cambridge, who yeah. has been putting this together and has, has done all the sort of um, the, the, the heavy lifting on, on, on putting this together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. This is the main topic. It is. It's becoming a copyright specialist. Can I say something about becoming? You can. So. By all means. Yes. Yesterday I was um, hosting a webinar for my module with the fabulous uh, Dave White from the University of the Arts London. He's mm. head of digital education there. And um, he was also talking about this idea about learning as becoming. Mm. And, it, you know, when you study any subject that um, a lot of it is about, you know, becoming that type of that you know whether it's a sociologist whether it's a historian it's a kind of process that you go through and it's about your identity and this really really resonates I think with this idea of the the kind of you know becoming a copyright specialist particularly when lots of us actually don't necessarily deliberately set out to do this as well it's a bit of a journey sometimes it's a bit of an uncomfortable process as well and, you know, there's these kind of threshold concepts, all sorts of things. There's quite a lot of anxiety tied up in it. So I just think that this is this is really fantastic to have two great people from our community again joining us to talk about becoming a copyright specialist. And I yeah, I'm I, I'm, I'm I see it as a process as yeah, well. It is it's absolutely a process. So um, we're going to have uh, Tim Riley joining us from from the University of Aberdeen. Um, in a moment, but first of all, we're going to have Lisa Moore, Copyright and Compliance Manager, at the University of the Creative Arts. So, Lisa, can you, can we hear you? Can we see you? Do you want to turn your targeting computer on? Here I am. Can you hear there me? There you are, Lisa. Great. And I remember, I think the first time we met was January 2015, Cardiff. Was that yeah. right? When I was running Copyright the Card Game for the first time. So uh, it was it was great to meet you then. And obviously you are now, well, I say obviously, you're going to tell us your story, but we work together on the on the copyright negotiation group and all sorts of things. And you're a regular at the webinar. So um, I, I won't say too much more other than to say over to you and thank you so much for uh, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so it's great to come and sort of share my story. Um, <clears throat> I've put on my first slide my double life because I don't do copyright um, full time at the university I work at, but rather I um, lead this double life where I'm a yoga teacher and also a copyright specialist at the University for the Creative Arts. And that might resonate with some of you, perhaps some of you have two jobs. And for me, it's been really positive where the one has really massively helped um, the other. So I will talk a little bit um, about that. Um, so <laughs> um, this is just a breakdown of kind of what I've I've learned. I'll go into this in more detail, but um, it's massively helped me gain confidence, um, be curious about possibilities, to take informed risks, very important, not to be overwhelmed, to trust my instincts and to find a community has been um, has been really helpful. So I will talk a little bit about that um, towards the end. So a little bit about um, myself. Um, so I was born in 1980. I think um, Debbie Harry had released Call Me. Um, there were chunky mobile phones and BMX bikes. Um, 
and yeah, the 80s were wonderful. So I was born in 1980 in Hampshire, that's me on the left. And as a child, um, I was not creative, I was not academic at all, I was very creative. Um, so the idea that I would end up in a library at a university is just hilarious to me because I was, um, yeah, I was not academic at all. And um, this image is of me um, aged, I think I'm maybe four, and I had created my own um, community of balloon friends. Um, so when I say build a community, this is not what I'm, <laughs> this is not what I'm talking about, uh, joining a community, but um, yeah, I was very artistic, shall we say, and uh, yeah, creating balloon friends. So what that led me to kind of go on to was to go to art school. And from 1999 to 2004, I studied at art school at the Surrey Institute of Art and Design, and I gained um, a BA in three-dimensional design and an MA in contemporary craft. And probably the most um, sort of realistic uh, picture of what I did was that middle one. I kind of did porcelain sculptures where they were little pieces of porcelain that slotted together to make these, um, these sculptures. So I did a lot of a lot of that, and I was lucky enough to be published in Ceramic Review. I had an exhibition in London, and um, very fortunate to go to Japan for a symposium there. Um, so yeah, so I sort of um, had this artistic uh, life, which was great. And interestingly, the Surrey Institute of Art and Design became the university that I now work at. Um, so I sort of. Uh, came back full circle um, eventually. So after I graduated from art school, I struggled to find a job, as you can kind of imagine. So I went into um, archives and modern records management. Um, I worked at the Surrey History Centre and um, looked after adoption records there. Uh, and it it really helped. Um, it, it, it kind of helped me with things like attention to detail. Um, I went on after working at the archive um, center, I went on to work as a registrar. Um, so if you have been at the wedding and there's the person sat with the book, um, that was me. Uh, I was a registrar of births, deaths and marriages. Um, and because I, I came from this artistic background, I did struggle. I had dyslexia, I struggled quite a lot. And something that this really helped me with um, these jobs was just attention to detail. Um, and uh, yeah, following on from that, I kind of felt that those jobs, um, while they were useful, I really wanted to be an educator. I really felt that that was my kind of calling, if you like. Um, and so after a while, I looked up jobs and what do you know, my old art school had a job um, in the library of all places. So I applied and um, yeah, and uh, got this great job in the library. And it was really through encouragement of my boss at the time that they persuaded me to take the postgraduate diploma in um, information studies at Aberystwyth and to become a kind of qualified librarian. And at the same time, for some kind of crazy reason, at the same time, I decided that I would also take a yoga teacher training and, uh, and do both at the same time, which, is, which I don't recommend. Um, so yeah, so I kind of had this strange parallel where I was learning all this librarian um, uh, uh, work and then I was also training as a yoga teacher. So, um, so that's what I did from kind of 2009-ish. Um, and while I was working in the library, what I found, how I kind of came to be in, um, to do with copyright, I loved tackling a tricky problem. And that might resonate with some of you. And that kind of got round um, uh, to other colleagues. If something came in and it was a kind of tricky question or it was complicated and it had this copyright or um, something about ethics, you know, it kind of came my way because I quite liked tackling those sorts of things. Um, and the more I did it, it wasn't part of my job, but the more I did it, the more I got these queries um, to, to answer and, and kind of word got round. 
so I was very lucky that um, the sort of my, my bosses at the time sort of saw these queries coming in. Someone was looking after the CLA license. Someone else was looking after the ERA license, and they kind of had the idea to actually bring all of it together into one job. Um, and I was I was kind of um, offered this this job. So I was very lucky that it sort of evolved. Um, uh, and I was involved in in kind of what that job description would look like. Um, so I was very uh, fortunate from from that that perspective. Um, and one of the first things I had to tackle was they put copyright and digitization together in the job. And my university had 17,000 VHS to transfer. Also, th their original idea was to transfer all of them, which was kind of a bit crazy. But I had to tackle again this sort of tricky problem of what do we do with 17,000 VHS, which are stored off site. Um, so that was one of the one of the other things I had to tackle. So working in an arts institution, arts university, um, does definitely come up with lots of interesting queries. Um, I get asked a lot about things like collages, um, music. Um, the most recent one was about architectural plans being screen printed. Um, it, it really massively varies. And I don't find that the, the queries that I get are always the same. Um, it, it, it really does. It's just so completely different from one query to the next. And I find that they tend to be layered. So there'll be a copyright element in there, but there might also be an ethical component to that. There might be um, like data protection. Um, it can be just so layered. And part of kind of what I have to do is, is kind of take it apart in a way, the query um, and, 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 and examine it. So um, that's, what, that's what I find. As well as dealing with student and staff kind of queries around copyright, I also get involved in some of the projects that the university um, does. So this project was the Zandra Rhodes um, study collection. Um, and this is ongoing. We're, we're still involved in this. Um, so Zandra Rhodes was our chancellor at one point. So we've been involved in digitizing some of the um, clothes, the garments, um, some of her sketchbooks. These are some of her sketchbooks, which are amazing. Um, I'll put the link in the chat. So just really interesting and varied um, stuff. And I get involved in how we're going to license this and what kind of license we're going to put out. Um, interestingly, talking about Debbie Harry earlier, the garments, the drawings on the left are designs for Debbie Harry um, back in the day. So it's amazing. But yeah, I'll put the link in the chat and you can explore that collection if you if you if it's of interest. So. I kind of worked this job as a copyright officer and got a little bit more confident. We would go out on the road to various campuses and um, we would promote um, copyright resources. And uh, my colleague who deals with open access, um, she came along as well. And we just kind of went round and, and talked to people <laughs> and it's part of what I did. But this is sort of what I, I wanted to really talk about. Something I massively struggled with um, was gaining the confidence, particularly to speak in public. Um, and colleagues, um, often other copyright colleagues I talk to, it's massively about trusting that you know what you know. You have all this knowledge. You've done the events and you've done the research and, and just trusting that you, you do know what you know. Um, this event in 2017 was probably the scariest one I've ever done. Um, if you know the Welcome Trust, there's an auditorium there, and I couldn't believe when I came to this event that it was going to be in this massive um, auditorium. So the picture on the left is just me petrified on stage. Um, but the public speaking does get better the more the more that you that you do talking in workshops about copyright, um, and the same at the same time I was um, a yoga teacher taking classes, and I gained confidence with having to demonstrate in class. I had to learn about anatomy and things. So um, yeah, massively gaining confidence and trusting that you do know what, what you know and, and trusting that. And then I put in this slide because a big part of what I've learned is a, just being curious about possibilities. 
So what I've learned is when a query comes in, it is about seeing whether an exception applies, whether a license um, might apply, what about copyright duration, um, has someone else had this issue? Um, and just, yeah, being, being really curious. And again, through what I've done with my yoga teaching is a playful approach, um, is not being constrained by what I teach and that it has to be certain poses. It's, it's having this more um, free uh, approach and looking at all of the possibilities. And then I guess um, this is probably similar for, for many of us um, to, to take informed um, risks and particularly like the pandemic kind of forced that. Uh, we had to um, start to think about taking risks to just deliver content to students. Um, and I've learned from uh, artists that I talk to and having been an artist myself, uh, that, that massively part of the DNA of being an artist is taking risks, is pushing those boundaries. Um, so I had to kind of find my, my rebellious streak as well. Um, when I first joined the university, they were very much saying no <laughs> to anything. They were very risk averse. Um, and actually, when you come, when you learn more and more and more about copyright, um, particularly about the exceptions and what, what's written in the exceptions, actually looking at the legislation in detail, you find that, that sometimes it's what's not said in the legislation and, and that can bring up possibilities. So yeah. The, the COVID pandemic definitely um, enabled me to uh, take um, informed risks. And then another thing I wanted to share was, is to not be so overwhelmed. Um, I really felt when I first started my job as a copyright um, officer, I massively felt the pressure to answer queries straight away. Um, that, I think taking your time is is definitely something that um, I found really useful. Um, like I've said, taking time to unpick the query, it's, it's often layered um, for me. And then this has been a re more recent thing I've found is discussing the issue uh, with that student or that staff member and having a bit of a two way conversation. So rather than feeling that you have to have the answer um, that I had to have the answer there and then on a plate. Um, it's actually kind of discussing discussing that issue uh, with them and saying, well, how about this and what about that? And in my um, in my yoga teaching, quite often people will say, well, you know, I felt this in my body here when we moved and we did that. And it's kind of like, oh, that's interesting. You know, I, I don't necessarily have the answer as to why that might be. But let's talk about that and kind of having that dialogue um, rather than I think I put too much pressure on myself, probably to begin with, that I had to have kind of a clear cut answer straight straight away. Um, so that might resonate with you. Um, and then just trusting your instincts. I guess this is a time. I mean, I don't know what other people feel. This might be like a time thing. Over time, you start to develop a feeling for stuff and that you can gradually start to just develop your instincts about when a query comes in, what your initial thoughts are as to whether it's sort of um, whether it's kind of fair, uh, what they're wanting to do. Um, I'm constantly asking myself, um, what, what am I comfortable? What am I comfortable with? Um, and is this now veering out of my my comfort zone and feeling maybe um, uh that that sometimes the person asking the query they want a particular answer um which perhaps is 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 not what you're able to to give so it's sort of um trusting trusting your instincts and yeah you're accountable so i think you've got to be comfortable with whatever you're um advising and again the same with my um my life as a yoga teacher i stand up there um i have to kind of have that accountability and what I've started to do is I it's actually moved more into therapy therapeutic movement and therapeutic exercise because that's just what I'm more comfortable with and what I sort of have belief in I suppose so my last slide is just around finding community um and that's just been so um helpful 
to have uh, the copy seat community um, to have opportunities like ice pops to network with people to ask others um, and to just sort of um, chat not not necessarily about copyright but about other things um, has just been really helpful so that copyright doesn't feel so scary um, talking about legal issues and legal implications is all a bit scary so having that community has definitely um, has definitely helped me and that's me I think that was 15 minutes thank you for listening thank you thank you so much Lisa that yeah. was absolutely fantastic yeah um, round of applause. really great yeah round of applause yeah. for Lisa so we've got some really great chats uh, comments coming into the chat I would uh, encourage people to either post questions or further reflections on everything Lisa said there's definitely a few things we would like to pick up so we're going to yeah. have a conversation um, at the end of the session yeah where we after we've we've heard from Tim so that was brilliant it was brilliant um let us stay now. on the line Lisa. Stay we will on the come, line. We'll come we, back to absolutely. you I think there's going to be some interesting parallels um as we're going on another journey aren't we now we are we're, we're going we're we're, we're, we're we're sailing on the the seven seas I think, with I think Tim. this one's got a bit of a nautical theme it is nautical but nice we've got there <laughs> Tim are you there hello I'm here can you hear me we can hear you loud and clear so okay Tim Riley information Wonderful. advisor copyright at the University of Aberdeen over to you explain what this is all about please Yes, I have got some explaining to do, I think. <laughs> okay, thanks ever so much for inviting me to talk to you today. It's wonderful to be with you and thank you everyone for listening. Um, as you see, I've gone with a kind of piratical theme. I suppose it's sort of copyright related um, for my presentation here. Um, but I'm gonna yeah, take you on a journey. Um, and yeah, thinking about this, it really is a journey, I think, rather than a destination. I know that's quite cliche to say, um, but I'm definitely gonna be focused on the becoming part of the, of the question um, because I feel like it's, it's always a process of learning you're always always moving um it's not like a set destination that you ever reach um it's yeah ongoing process so yeah i've got that quote there i think it's ralph waldo emerson slightly out of context i think he was talking about life with this quote what is life without copyright really so so what i want to do today um this is my quick itinerary here i'm going to talk a little bit about sort of who i am how i ended up here um, then I want to look more generally at maybe some kind of personal qualities or skills that you might want to develop if you're thinking of becoming a copyright specialist. And then I've just got a few tips at the end, um, things that I've kind of learned along the way that might help you as well. Okay. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. How did I end up here? Um, a question which I often ask myself. Um, and it might surprise you to know, maybe not, that I'm another one of these sort of creative people um I'm basically a failed musician really um so I'm not going to start right from the very beginning from my beginnings in the 1980s we'll skip through that bit um but I'll start um pick up with my um yeah experience at university um where I did um, a music degree as my first degree um it was great fun I really loved it but when I finished I basically had no idea what I was going to do um so I sort of undenied and procrastinated and I the only thing that I could think of doing, which is basically to do another music degree. <laughs> so um, I did yeah, a second degree, um, an MA in music. Um, and surprise, surprise, by the time I got to the end of that, I still didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. Um, I was in exactly the same position. The only difference was I was significantly poorer than I was at the start of the degree. Um, so I thought, oh, it's, it's time to go and look for like proper work. Um, so I yeah, when I was studying, I'd done part-time work, in waste disposal at a supermarket, which was not great fun. Um, and then I had a job, um, I was basically working at Men's Outfitters, um, if you can believe it. Um, but yeah, I didn't particularly enjoy it. And then just by chance, I saw a job advertised uh, for a library assistant at the University Library, where I studied, um, this was down in Bristol. Um, so I applied for this job. Um, I had no expectations that I would get it, um, but I don't know whether it's just because I had a nice suit because I worked in an outfitters, um, but they offered me a job as a library assistant, which I gladly took. Um, it was advertised as just being temporary for a year, um, so I took it on, um, and then when it came to the end of the 12 months, I still didn't know what I was going to do, but I went to speak to my manager and said, 
um, look, my contract's coming to an end. Um, what can I do? And she checked with HR, and there'd been some kind of error. Um, I'd actually been put on a permanent contract. So I ended up working for, um, for the University of Bristol for a good number of years, doing various different jobs. Um, so my first role, of course, was as the library assistant. And so I got my first introduction to copyright there um, with the usual kind of things um, you get told about copyright um, limits for photocopying. Um, I worked for a bit with our, was then our disability service in the library, um, providing materials in alternative formats. So I became a little bit aware of the kind of legislation around that kind of area. Um, so I was producing material, actually making the um, alternative format copies for some of our users. Um, if you ever tried to make Derrida accessible, um, don't go there. <laughs> um, and also, um, I worked a little bit. Um, social media was starting to become a thing as I worked at the library. Um, so I was producing posters and sometimes things for Facebook posts, that kind of thing. So again, I started to become aware of copyright around reusing images and things like that. Um, but it wasn't really until I kind of moved on a bit further that copyright started to become more and more of a thing in my the roles that I did. So I worked for a while as a long um, I did an, an MSc degree in Library and Information Management at Huey. I worked in the career service for a bit. And the, really, the first job where copyright was a major aspect, what I did um, was when I became an open access manager um, at Bristol. Um, so with this, I really became exposed to all the issues around licensing, um, open access, um, under mandates, um, the use of third party material in publications. Uh, that really came to the fore there. Um, and then when I moved on to become a subject librarian, uh, I was tasked with um, providing the copyright advice for basically anything that wasn't science. So all the arts and humanities, I was the main um, point of contact for anybody who had a copyright query around that kind of area. Um, and at the same time, I took on a part-time role um, as a copyright advisor for a MOOC, a massive online open course that was being developed by the university. Um, it was one of their first forays into this kind of area or one of the first ones where they were opening it up and trying to promote it more widely to the public. So they were quite risk averse um, with what they were putting on there. Um, so it was my job was to kind of source images, source material, clear rights with people, keep a log of everything. Um, so that was probably the first job I had where, yeah, copyright was, yeah, literally all I was doing. That was only part time. Um, I then moved to Aberdeen, became a liaison librarian at RGU. And then just over a year ago, I got my first dedicated copyright post here at the University of Aberdeen. Um, so this is the first role full time where all I do is basically copyright related stuff. Um, you see in here, yeah, I've got the pirate captain on the image. Uh, hopefully my job does not involve me leaving quite as much chaos and destruction in my wake as this picture might imply. Um, but um, yeah, the main uh, objects of my role, I look after inquiries, um, provide guidance for people. Um, I've started to do teaching around copyright literacy, particularly to postgrad students, um, which has been really interesting. Um, students are actually a lot more in involved and a lot more engaged with this topic than you might think. Actually, I've been surprised. Um, some of them are actually more engaged than the staff I've spoken to, which is quite interesting. Um, also, to oversee the CLA license, um, managing that. A really interesting copyright literacy project at the moment, where we're making a copyright policy and a copyright literacy strategy for the university. And we're developing those, which is really exciting. Um, I've got I had loads of questions about it, trying to find out what other people are doing. So if you've been on this copy seek, we've seen my pleas for information going out on there. So there we go. Um, just to kind of make this a bit more interesting visual, here's just a couple of things I've been working on. So yeah, I've been revamping our copyright guidance pages, trying to make them more accessible and a bit less like Tolstoy and a bit more <laughs> uh, short and digestible. Um, making information leaflets there, I've got one about Creative Commons explained through the medium of ice cream. Um, and then some of the, the teaching and presentations I've done, um, promoting our copyright literacy policy there. And um, as well, yeah, some of the teaching I've done with postgrads, getting them to think about um, their rights when they're publishing. So that's enough about me. So let's look now at some of the personal qualities that I think you might need or things to, might to think about if you want to become a copyright specialist. Um, I could have also called, called this risk factors, I suppose. <laughs> things to watch out for if you're concerned about yourself or a loved one, you think this might happen to you. Here's what you want to watch out for. So, sorry, oh, here we go. 
So I think the reason, one of the reasons why I ended up why, why I am today is my inability to say no. Um, maybe this is a bit flippant, um, but probably it's more like a willingness to take things on, to take risks and to try new things um, and to get stuck in. Um, it's also, as has been mentioned already, solving problems, puzzling things out is a, a key part of being a, a copyright specialist in my, in my opinion. Certainly something I've found um, is you need to get, yeah, kind of dig deep, um, interrogate things, think about different possibilities, different options, what do you really want? Um, what can you do within the law? What level of risk are you willing to take on? And sort of slotting all that together. Um, as well, yeah, being comfortable with risk and uncertainty. Of course, there are many gray areas in copyright. Um, it's not always obvious um, the correct inverted commas the course of action is. It's not always a clearly defined right or wrong, um, particularly with the copyright exceptions. So it's being comfortable with risk and working with uncertainty as well. Um, it's something you, you might not have to begin with, but you, I think you can develop that skill as well. Um, another thing I think is really important um, is an ability to explain complex ideas um, in a simple and straightforward way. Um, people often come to you and they want a quick um, and straightforward answer. As with, co with copyright, that's not always easy to do. It's not always the case that there's um, a simple answer that you can give. So uh, being patient, um, being able to, to probe people and find out what they really want, and then being able to explain sometimes quite complex legal ideas in, an, in a digestible and understandable way. Oh, I think that's a really important skill to develop as well. Um, both um, sort of orally, um, sort of through spoken face-to-face -face, um, queries, and also if you're writing copy for, for web pages and guides and that kind of thing as well. Um, it's important there, of course, as well. Um, and again, here with cats again, uh, curiosity. Um, I think that's something that's really important. If you want to become a specialist, if you really want to get, get down and, and know about copyright, um, you've got to be yeah, curious and interested in it, really, um, and be willing to, to kind of read around, um, to investigate things, um, to think about different possibilities when inquiries and queries come in, uh, but also sort of keeping yourself up to date, um, just finding out what's going on, um, not being content with just looking at something on a surface level, but really digging in and finding out more about um, what's going on, what the current issues are, and reading around. So with all that in mind, here are my tips uh, for plain and sailing. These are just things I found that have helped me in my copyright journey. Um, so as I said, staying current and reading around, I think is really important. Um, and something maybe a bit, maybe this is just peculiar to me, but I found um, at least to begin with, I almost felt guilty when I was kind of like reading things or watching webinars, like it wasn't proper work, um, but it is really important. Um, it's really crucial for what we do. Um, so I've been trying to set aside time, um, dedicated time in the week um, to make sure I'm reading the news around copyright and, and taking time to, um, to educate myself. I think that's really important um, and something, yeah, not to feel guilty about. As has been mentioned before as well, joining online groups and mailing lists, I think that's really important. Um, Liz Copyseek is obviously the obvious one. It's been so helpful to me and my journey. Um, I really see this as kind of a collective endeavor. Um, there's not just one copyright specialist, it's kind of like a group thing. We often talk about the copyright hive mind, um, but it's, it's definitely not a, a single person thing. You're not alone. There's so many other people out there, so much expertise that's not kind of vested in one person. It's spread throughout the community, and that's something to really tap into um, and get involved with. Um, so following on from that as well, um, attending events, networking with people. Um, it's great to find out more about what's going on in the sector, what the developments are, what other people are doing. You can pinch ideas from other people um, with appropriate credit, of course. Um, it's also really good, I think, just to find out that you're not alone, um, particularly if you're the only copyright specialist or only person working on copyright at your particular workplace. It can be quite isolating sometimes. I think it's good to know that the issues you're facing, it's not just you, that there are other people grappling with the same things as well. So I'm all for attending events and networking where you can. Um, of course, it's not always possible to attend things in person. Sometimes things can be expensive, particularly if your organisation doesn't have a much of a budget for these sort of things. But since the pandemic, there's so much stuff that's online as well. Um, so you really take advantage of what's there. Um, something else, um, which has already been mentioned again, I think, 
Um, it's don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, and it's as much about knowing what you don't know as what you do know, not feeling under pressure to give people immediate answers if you're not quite sure. Um, I think part of being a specialist um, is as much about knowing the right questions to ask and the topics to explore and the things to think about rather than having an immediate answer um, at your fingertips in every situation. Um, so that's something that I've sort of struggled with, um, not being pressured to give an immediate answer if you're not sure and you need to do more research on something, being confident enough to say that. Um, I mentioned teaching and communication skills before, um, but some things I found really useful, um, I've done training um, on teaching, I did a short HEA, advanced HE um, course um, on that, that's been really helpful. Um, I even did a half day course on plain English, which is so, so useful um, for drafting web content, trying to make things um, digestible and understandable, that, that's been really, really helpful. It might not just be copyright, directly copyright related um, training and skills that are useful, it's sort of thinking about other things that relate to your role. Um, yeah, communication a big one. Like, yeah, certainly recommends um, doing courses on things like that. Um, UX user experience, um, I've done training on that as well. That's also been really helpful. Um, so it's these related areas you might not immediately think of. It's really good to explore these as well. Um, and finally, look out for opportunities, particularly if you're new and you're trying to get experience in this area. Um, look out for maybe projects you can get involved with, webinars you can attend. Um, does your organisation need somebody who's like a second point of contact for copyright queries? Um, can you help out with that? Um, just look out for the things that are there. Um, because most organisations are more than happy for anybody to step up and take um, charge of things related to copyright. It's often seen as being really scary. Um, and most people don't want to touch you with a barge pole. So um, if you're willing um, to take this on, um, most organisations would jump at that chance. So make the most of it. Um, so yeah, just to wrap up, um, expertise, it takes time, it's a, it's a journey. Here I've got the copyright barnacles, a really awful metaphor, but they kind of build up gradually, they gradually accumulate and you don't realise how many of them you've got on your hull until you, and you suddenly realise that you're, you're covered in all this copyright knowledge. Um, so it is gradual um, and, and don't expect it to come overnight. Um, so yeah, that's everything from me. Um, so is this the end? As I said, it's an ongoing journey. I'm always learning. Um, and I'm happy um, to chat to people if you've got similar issues at your organisation. If you ever want to get in touch, um, these are my contact details here. So thanks ever so much for listening. I hope it was interesting. Maybe not very much new stuff, but I think it's always good just to find out if people uh, have the same issues as well. So thanks very much. Thank you, Tim. Oh, that's fantastic. That was Thank fa you. absolutely brilliant. So we've definitely um, been on the journey. We've um, been on the journey. We've been on the journey. I, I hadn't thought about being barnacle encrusted, but I guess maybe we all <laughs> are to a certain extent. Uh, it's a good metaphor. It's a good absolutely. one. Um, so, uh, yeah, Lisa, Tim, fantastic. What I think was great and looking at the comments as well that we've had from from others in the room, uh, there's clearly a lot of creativity in what you both do um, and that you're driven by that and I'm interested in the the sort of complementary what might seem quite different about being a copyright specialist getting into the nuts and bolts of the law that you both picked up on and then some of the the, the sort of more creative arts being, a, being an artist being, being an artist that musician. sort of yeah. being in that yeah. mindset and I suppose in some ways I mean Lisa thinking about what you were saying about detail and finding it something where you weren't initially comfortable with getting into that level of detail but being an artist and being a creative person you do get into the detail it's just it's quite a different thing and then I suppose the other aspect of that is when you are getting into the detail of looking at copyright then you you have to avoid losing sight of the big picture the whole thing altogether what you're trying to do to help someone with so um, I mean, maybe starting with Lisa, is that is that something that you've sensed that sort of is, is it complementary to be to be a creative and artistic person and then to be dealing with something which can be seen as quite administrative? Yes, and, and definitely there's that perception of that my job is very administrative um, uh, by sort of fellow colleagues and things. But I think it's it's both, isn't it? You, you it's having that level of detail. And like I say, it's only recently that I will go to the legal exceptions, I'll look at the detail, look at what's said in the exception, but also what's not said. 
and then and then the cogs start to turn and maybe that's the creative element i mean like, oh this is possible or this is possible and then right. things kind of open open up and you're like oh wow amazing um so I, I kind of feel it's a bit of a bit of both for me it's having that detail and the patience to go through it um and do the research but also then letting your creative juices sort of um take over great great and, and tim how does that dynamic kind of work for you is, is it the same yeah I, I i think it's similar um and yeah i suppose uh, as lisa was saying i think in a presentation you kind of get a feel a kind of like an instinct for how things work as well um i don't know whether that's really related to the creativity thing but it's a kind of flow almost um I don't know what i'm trying to say here but it's um yeah you sort of you are looking at the detail but you you instinctively start to, to get a feel for things as well as you become more and more familiar with it um, yeah absolutely i think we did we did write at one point i think it's in the copyright e-learning that working through this thing is as much of an art as it is a science yeah uh, yeah i've just seen andrew um uh, hmm. has put into the chat about um artists and problem solving and it's all about working within limits so i think there are more allergies than you might think i mean the other thing is obviously i i i think that you know teaching about um copyright it, it does there are certain subjects like music and art where it is you know it is much more obvious how it is relevant i was um observing a music lecturer teaching earlier in the week at city um as part of my job i was doing a peer review of their teaching and they were teaching about sound design and they actually started talking about copyright because they were talking about um a, a podcast and they wanted students to kind of do some editing and then they were talking about sort of public domain um audio recordings that they'd got that students could work on and things like that so you know it's kind of inherent i think in those subjects even if it sort of it, it doesn't it certainly doesn't seem like a natural routine um but i mean it's how you got into it chris as well isn't it from yeah. the music side so i think I think it's 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 more usual than than yeah than you might think more usual than not <laughs> but certainly what makes it us interested in copyright is yeah its relationship to creativity and, and yeah. what what's that, that you know that, that whole dynamic there um another thing that we're that we've got a lot of um uh comments about is around that feeling of guilt about doing your own professional development mm. and a lot of people saying yes they 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 do feel that i mean something tim you were picking up on lisa have you had a similar sort of feeling um around the time that you spend actually getting Trying up to, to speed keep up with to it date, yeah lisa you're you're muted oh. yes yes definitely just definitely um and like like i think in the comments it was saying about webinars attending webinars and things you know that's massively part of your development so it's it is it's not time wasted or you know time you know away from other things it's really valuable is it is it recognized in, in either of your job descriptions because i was just kind of thinking about it like really to be somebody you know to be a copyright specialist to work in a kind of area like this you know we we really need to be you can't answer the questions can you without probably spending almost like you know maybe 20 percent of your week actually kind of keeping yourself up to date at least mm. you know I, I i think the time when i was at lse i had to spend a huge amount of time doing that but i i don't remember it being formally written down that i was allowed to do it i, I never do what anyway i, I just ignore you never that. do what it says in your job description no. just as a point of principle <laughs> i don't think it's explicitly stated in my job description um i might be mm. wrong um yeah. But yeah and it doesn't just benefit you it benefits other people as well and everyone else in your organization so it's not just a purely selfish personal thing it's say it's part of the job um update examples isn't it that you can use mm. in your teaching sessions it's about you know i mean it's just you know there's kind of stories coming out all the time about issues related to copyright if you if you didn't follow them and you just sort of relied on talking about something that you've learned about 10 15 years ago you know you wouldn't be doing your job properly and it's interesting after the pandemic 
you know, the my job has changed just for, just, you know, because of the way that teaching is now uh, taught where I where I work. But I don't think my job description has been sort of updated to reflect that. Um, yeah, it's interesting. No. Caroline saying, is any job, job description still accurate mm -hmm. after six months on the job? Well, yeah, probably. Probably not. And I think but part of that, probably to be fair, and this does, I think, link to the points that you're both making in talking about your journey and interesting Lisa that you were talking about having the opportunity to shape that job mm. typically when we come into a job you do shape it around yourself and there mm. is an act of creativity in taking what it says and interpreting that into what you think is needed for that yeah. that setting so I mean presumably your job does it continue to evolve Oh yeah, massively. Um, I now do data protection as kind of come into my job as well now. So I take care of that component as well. And again, initially you think there isn't the crossover, but then like I was saying, some queries have that layer in there as well, where it's actually copyright issue, but also a data protection issue. So there is overlap. Um, and some things I've been able to influence and bring into my job because I've felt it's needed. And then other things have kind of come come my way from from management and things yeah can can i just pick up on um simon's sort of put a, a comment about how it's a really tough thing being a band of one and nobody else understanding what you do i mean i guess that's where both of you talked about why you've got a you know not just your balloon friends lisa but your 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 copyright friends now is that i, I mean that is a, isn't it ultimately what we've got to do i think and i jackie can i ask tim um because you're you're now working on a copyright literacy strategy at aberdeen mm. Do you think it's part of that to be trying to expand that out from being just a band of one to perhaps get other colleagues to engage with it? Or is there a limit to how much other people can if there is somebody who's the copyright person? No, absolutely. It's, it's definitely about getting other people to engage as well. Um, it's not only about not having yourself as the single point of failure within an organisation, um, mm. but it's, yeah, empowering other people as well. I found other colleagues who I had no idea where we were interested in copyright, but they kind of stepped up and mm. said, yeah, can I be involved? Can I yeah, help monitor the mailbox? Can I pick up queries when you're away? So yeah, there is. There are other crazy people out there who are interested. They, in say they, they come stuff, out the so woodwork, don't they? They do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the kind of, it's the, the oh, oh, actually, yeah. And, and just a clarification, I see Simon said, yes, it's not a woe is me point. It's, it's the, the point is that community yeah. is important. Both all of us doing this together here now, and then within our institutions and linking all of, of yeah. those together. It's very important, but it time, so is lunch. Time is moving on, isn't it? Yeah. So thank you so much, oh, Tim yeah. and Lisa. Everyone's already been saying in the in the comments how much they enjoyed it. But that those were fantastic presentations. Really brilliant. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Thank uh, you so much. Yeah, really. so great to understand more about and where so you're creative from. as well. I have to say, I just loved both of your slides. I, there's all the things in there. Who could not love cats? and yoga and pirates and some fantastic <laughs> images um tim i really your slides with uh, you know they have made me chuckle a lot they're very very amusing um it's wonderful thank you thank you both of you so uh, before well, before we finish we yeah. will of course just um do the classic uh looking ahead to what's happening and uh, tim you made a point about keeping up to date and reading around we have a copyright news special we do for the next session on the 5th of may so if you're looking for an absolutely free to access briefing on everything you need to know about copyright you know the place to come at the beginning of may which is here um, and then after that we put in here now this is something people have known we've been working on for a long time with uh, Bart Maletti learning on screen yep the code of fair practice we are anticipating we will be ready to launch maybe not the full it'll definitely be a soft launch we mm. think we will have something to share with you on the 9th of June yes um, I think so. so we're very very so. excited about that um, we are taking a break. Um, July is ice pop, so yeah. we felt that we probably won't be running a webinar in July because we'll be getting ready, hopefully seeing some of you at ice pops. Um, and um, August, I think typically we haven't run a webinar. Lots of people are on holiday. Mm -hmm. If we get lots and lots of feedback and people ple pleading with us to, to do a, a webinar, of course, you know, we're, we're always available. But we are looking for um, ideas for future topics. We've just 
um, had a bit of an exchange with Christina. If anybody else would like to speak in this series about becoming a copyright specialist, then it is very much about that. Mm -hmm. You know, people, we want people at the start of their journey. I know we had Chris later um, uh, at the last session. So mm -hmm. people who are earlier in their career, people who feel that they've, you know, they have maybe become a copyright specialist mm -hmm. as well. But but we want, we want a, a range of voices. So we will probably do another one of these um, later this year but if you've got any topics then please do drop us a line and please look out for that survey and that's also the place to give us some feedback so we have of course one, one last, last thing. thing you've heard of chat gpt but that's nothing compared to cat gpt so here we go this is a close-up of what do cats think of copyright and cat gpt brought to you by the latest in cat ai technology yes. meow 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 Meow, 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 meow. It's fantastic, isn't yes. it? It is profound. Yes. It is. Very profound. Yes. Um, so check out Cat GPT if you're getting, if you're, if people are getting sort of, you know, overly stressed and worried about Chat GPT, lighten the mood. Lighten the mood. Bring and a cat in. So thank you very much for having us. Yep. We'll that see was. you next time. <laughs>